You better be careful with that cookie. For your goats? Or our guest. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just think keep it in mind. Was there a warmer in the taco meat the other day? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't eat the meat. Y'all are in here on your own. <clears throat> I had to laugh because at the party Saturday, I made dip. And my recipe called for meat in it, and I purposely left it out so that Kathy could have some. Mm -hmm. And then Kathy made us nachos with meat. After we got ours. She did. It was really sweet. I was yeah. like, oh, look at yeah. it. <laughs> Maybe couldn't have finished up all that. <laughs> Good morning. How are you? Here's the How are you feeling, Carmen? I'm out of bed. Yes, I'm proud. That's good. Um, January 26th is the date. They're putting in my second shunt. Okay. Okay. January 26th. So uh, the whole month of January, I'll be running back and forth. To Is that going to be? <coughs> okay, so that'll be in Abilene? Yeah, Kendrick North. Evie, you want to do our welcome in prayer? Um, I told today. him I would some, but not today. <laughs> it's okay, bye. I'm not prepared uh, today. Well, it's time to get things rolling, so we're going to go ahead and get things rolling. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, for those of you joining us online, welcome. If any of you guys uh, at uh, Johnson County are joining us today, we want to give a special welcome to you guys. Um, just want to go ahead and start things off right, and we're going to start with prayer. So let's pray together. Lord God, I want to come to you and just say thank you. Uh, I thank you so much for Jesus, for because he is God with us. And um, it's just... An amazing miracle. Um, and though we've invented a whole bunch of traditions that kind of distract us away from you, God, this season is all about you. It's all about coming down from heaven to earth, and it points the way towards the cross and towards the empty grave. <clears throat> I thank you for that. So I just ask you uh, today, come here. Um, we want to feel your presence. We want to walk away changed and better, more like Jesus. And so um, come enjoy the worship we have to offer as we sing these Christmas songs. And, um, and then change us with your word, God. Uh, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to step out of the way. We're going to get things rolling. You guys can stand. You can sit however you feel comfortable. But we're going to worship together one way or another. <clears throat> All right, we're going to start off with angels we have heard on high. Prepare to get your lungs destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> Take a deep breath, okay?
second, catch your breath. It's not every day we get to praise God in Latin, huh? All right, let's sing God rest you, merry gentlemen. comfort in terms of, hey, you know, I got a nice comfortable seat, or I got air conditioning, but that's not the kind of comfort it's talking about. I mean, it's talking about when we stop and we consider the state of where we are without God, uh, the right fear we have uh, of living every day without Him, um, and what our sin has brought us. Man, the comfort that comes from knowing what Jesus did for us is uh, just a huge relief. And it does bring joy. All right, next song, uh, I say this a lot, but it's not a traditional Christmas song. But everything it says is totally Christmas. So we're going to sing all this glory. Our Christmas. <laughs>
like the sun. standards God's always been an odd duck but to think about quite possibly the most glorious night in all creation was all about this little baby sitting in a food trough basically um, is just just God's style uh, I like it let's sing silent night
So, join me, please. Lord God, I come to you again, and I just want to, again, say thank you so much for what you did, uh, leaving heaven behind, being born in Bethlehem uh, 2,000 some odd years ago, uh, just an amazing miracle, God, and we saw your glory, just like John 1 says, we beheld glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And God, that, that is the God I love. A God who is full of grace and truth. And today we just want to tackle uh, your word, open it up, and um, open our hearts up to your truth. And God, in that way, to receive your grace. I just... Uh, I'm humbled by the fact that you love us so much that you gave us uh, your word uh, to show us who you are and then um, how to follow Jesus. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> All right. Well, guys, we are going through a series, and um, I realize I forgot my Bible. <laughs> oh, my God. Goodness, which yes, one? Oh my goodness. It should be over there, I think, on your left. Nope, not that one. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Yep, that's the right one. My bad. Oh my goodness. Uh, at least I can't go through a message without it. I've been through more sermons than I care for. Care to recall uh, that didn't need a Bible. Um, so. I'm grateful that I have to rely on it. Um, but anyway, we've been going through this series, looking at four keys to living um, through the holidays and actually making them happy holidays, which is, you know, a novel thought. I know that we would actually enjoy Christmas and, and maybe Thanksgiving and New Year's too. It's just it's this weird thought that we would actually want to enjoy this time of the year. 
Uh, but simple fact is, or in all reality, sarcasm aside, man, it's a hard time of year for a lot of people. Um, uh, this is uh, the Christmas time idea is definitely God's idea, and so in that way, it, it's perfect. And um, if we all in the way he asked us to, we wouldn't have these problems. But let's face it, we don't. Ain't none of us perfect, and some of us are a little closer to imperfect than others. Um, and so, really, that's kind of the thing I want to talk about, is this idea of imperfect people. Um, I kind of uh, titled the sermon, Dealing with the Ghosts of Christmas Past, um, because... For a lot of people, that's what Christmas is all about. It's about what's happened in the past that keeps us from enjoying Christmas today. Um, and so that's what I wanted to deal with, uh, because we have relational problems. And let's face it, we all have it. E even two great people uh, who have limited contact with each other still will have conflict every once in a while. And the more contact we have with people, the more that conflict happens, the more odds, uh, well, the odds get higher and higher that one of those conflicts is going to be uh, maybe trauma-inducing. Um, we have lots of things that, that can cause huge problems in relationships. And so that's really what I want to deal with, because uh, we have this trauma. And it makes the holidays harder and harder to deal with. And, and for some people, it's honestly, it's even unbearable. Some people would just rather check out of that as much as they can. Um, and I can understand that. Because what some of the stories I've heard, I get it. Uh, um, it. It's not what I want for anybody. It's certainly not what God wants for anybody. Because whether you celebrate Christmas or not, whether you celebrate it the way the United States prefers to, or you have your own way of celebrating it, Whatever, um, the point is that whether it's this time of year or any other time of year, God doesn't want us having those ghosts in our past, uh, the problems we have in relationships. He doesn't want us to have to wrestle with that day in and day out from an event that happened potentially years ago, maybe decades ago for some people. And so he wants us to deal with it in a way that's healthy. And just doing some research uh, in, the, in this, I, I came across a story um, on the Huffington Post. And if you're interested in uh, the article, um, so you get the full story um, instead of my secondhand version um, that's abbreviated at best. But anyway, this, this lady was basically just saying, hey, you know, I'm not spending Christmas with my family and I'm happier than I've ever been. Uh, for that. And, and honestly, she summed up a lot of people with that statement right there uh, because we all have these problems to some extent. Like I said, for some people, these problems are huge. For this lady, basically what it was is that she grew up in a conservative home. Uh, it, it was a Christian home and uh, one that pretty much looks like your typical, what would be described today by polling um, groups uh, as the typical white evangelical Christian home, okay? So typically Republican uh, and uh, very conservative in, in, in all their views. And so this young lady, when she was young anyway, um, grew up like her, her best friend in school. Uh, was gay. Um, and uh, she did not share many of the views of her parents. And she swallowed that down throughout her childhood. Every once in a while stuff would come out. You know, you can't bottle that stuff up forever. But for the most part, she stuffed it down. And um, finally, she was on a phone call um, in the election of 2016 with her parent during the election. I think it was just after the election of 2016. And her parents, her mom basically said, that, hey, we voted for Trump and we're 
glad to have done it. And um, for her, this young lady was just, that was the last straw. She couldn't take it. Um, she had followed along with uh, the left-hand side of the political spectrum. Um, that's where she was. And um, she just couldn't take it, being around that. Um, and so she basically hung up on her parents and didn't call them again. And um, finally, like a month and a half later, her dad calls her and says, hey, why are you giving us the cold shoulder? And she had time to compose her thoughts and her emotions. And so she basically just calmly laid it out. And she hadn't been able to do that in the past. And so that she would, was able to calmly explain things, I'm glad. That's about the only good part in the story I can really find. Basically, she, she had come to the point where not just a matter of political differences. It was all these philosophical differences, like uh, where they landed on the idea of homosexuality was one. And while politics has invaded that and tried to deal with that, um, it's not just a political issue, because these are people's lives we're talking about. Um, and so, Things like that. And, and basically, she just laid out and said, all these philosophical things that you look at this way, I look at a different way. And it's been a huge source of stress in my life for me to bottle this up and contain it all these years. And I just can't do that anymore. And, and I can't stand being around people who are, who are philosophically the opposite of me. And so she basically told her dad, I'm done with you guys. And uh, she uh, she had one more contact with him as, at the time of writing the article anyway, uh, where she went home, dropped off some stuff that basically belonged to her parents, got some stuff out of her room that she thought she would want for sentimental reasons or whatever, and that was it. And that... that visit took about 10 minutes and her parents were trying to say hey look let's talk this out you know what's and she's just like no, I'm done I'm done and, and the sad part is that while while her story is unique to her obviously that kind of a story if you back up and look at it in a more generic sense is pretty common there, there's somebody that we basically said I'm done with uh, a lot of people, an increasing number of people, but it's never been rare. Um, we just have a culture that is more and more saying, hey, you need to cut out toxic people from your life. And while that's true sometimes, there's times that's not true. Um, well, I'll get further into that statement. Um, that's the ways that it, it, it's not, uh, that it's overused and misused. But the point is, is that there's these tr relational traumas that we have, that some people have, and it just ruins every get together. And just the thought of having to go be around this person, and some of it, some of it's 100% legitimate, and, and you have reasons for experiencing that. But some of it we make up, some of it's our own fault, and so I just want to kind of get into these. And look what the Bible has to say about how to deal with these relationships. And this this could be a massive series all on its own. Um, and so I'm going to try and squish this down into about, you know, probably, what, another 20 minutes? Yeah, something like that. Uh, another 25 minutes or so. And we're going to take a look and, and see just one piece of scripture, really, that talks about these relationships and how to deal with them. And um, uh, that, that Huffington Post author um, basically said she'd run into people. Um, uh, you know, and when it came out in the conversation that she didn't have anything to do with her parents anymore, she'd said, you know, that person would typically say, I'm sorry. And she was at a point in her life, the author was, where I was like, I'm not. And so... I wish I could talk with her personally. I wish she were here maybe to hear this, not that this would be able to solve everything in one one message. 
and, and she would go home and deal with everything properly. It, that's just probably not the reality. But I, I'm going to come here. We're going to take a look at some things that God has to say, which gives us some very realistic and very effective ways to deal with these relationship problems that causes, well, causes Christmas and other times we get together with uh, family and friends to be a problem for us, to cause stress, to cause anxiety to where we're not enjoying this time of year anymore. And that, that's not what God wants. He wants us to enjoy every day, whether it's December 25th or whether it's August 25th. It doesn't matter. Uh, we can always um, enjoy that. And the relationships in our lives should not be such a cause of stress and anxiety that we are unable to enjoy getting together with family or friend, those friends. Uh, we should be able to work things out. So I want to look at the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. And we got a small piece of scripture in here that we're going to look at. So Colossians chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 12 through 15. So, it says this, Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace which comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. Okay. There's a lot in here. Uh, and I love this. It's simple, and yet it meets us where we're at, no matter the, the depth of complexity in the issues we're dealing with with people. So... First off, starts off in verse 12, says, Since God chose you to be holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And, and the main thing that jumps out at me with that is this idea that you're, we're supposed to clothe ourselves with that. Well, you know, I got up this morning, when I got dressed, I made a choice on what to wear. I picked this shirt, I picked these pants, I picked the, these shoes. I picked everything. No one chose it for me. No one forced me to wear this. Um, it's my choice. It's an act of the will. It's the same thing with these things, okay? This is what we need to make a willful choice to be like, to exercise in our lives, to put on like clothes is what it, it gives and so it starts off with this tender hearted mercy now I, I know some people who tender hearted is not a word you would apply to um, I, I, don't know why I mom, mean I'm not looking at anybody yeah, yeah. my <laughs> wife she's, she's thinking I'm talking about her <laughs> and she's not the most naturally compassionate person I know, uh, I will say that. Uh, but regardless, this tender heart of mercy, God says, put it on. And so when you're dealing with somebody that you've had a major problem with in the past, that tender heart of mercy, that, that idea of being tender hearted is all about you stopping your perspective and looking at theirs. It, it, it's okay, what happened with them? What caused them? Even if it's entirely their fault. Even if it's something as traumatic as some kind of sexual assault of some sort, what on earth caused them to reach the point in their life, that low point in their life, to where they'd be willing to do something like that? We can have empathy for even people who have, by earthly standards anyway, no right to it. So no matter what that trauma is we've suffered from, another person or with another person usually it's with because most of these relationship problems are two people with their own problems coming together and rubbing up against each other the wrong way uh, but regardless this tender hearted mercy is all about stopping and understanding their perspective and we can be hard with someone we can tell them the hard truths they need to hear 
and we can still be tender-hearted doing it, which just sounds like a complete contradiction, but it's not necessarily, because we can understand where they're coming from, what led them to the point where they were willing to participate in this traumatic event, and tell them the hard truths they need to hear. And maybe our emotions get caught up and we sound angry, but we can still be thinking, even in the middle of that, this person, they got problems that they were willing to, part to do this, to participate in this traumatic event. And um, so there's, in a way, we can feel pity for even the worst souls on earth um, and, and the, the crimes that have been committed, if that's the case. But it's all it's a matter of choice. It's a matter of putting it on like a shirt or something. It's an act of the will. We have to step into that person's shoes in order to put on tender-hearted mercy. We have to stop and think about it. It's a choice. It's not going to be something that comes natural. And that's hard. The deeper the trauma, the harder that is. But it's there. So we put on this tender heart of mercy. We put on kindness. And once we've gotten into an argument with someone, once we've had this traumatic event happen between us, kindness is not generally the reaction we want to go at. We, we just want to, we want to be hard. We want to be mean. We want to be angry. We want to give in to all those negative feelings that we are indeed feeling. And um, God's saying, no, no, no. Put it on just like your shirt. Put on that kindness. Put on humility. I think that might be the most godly command he's given us. It's time and time again, he talks about the need for us to be humble. Because you know what? We're not always right. Uh, I've known people who always think they're right. And humble is not a term I would attach to that person. Man, think about the best people you know. I mean, just the people you, you hold in respect. Isn't humility somewhere in there? I mean, I, I've said before that um, back in, for the election of 2016, um, honestly, probably my biggest problem with President Trump was his lack of humility. I never saw it. Now, admittedly, I, I've, over the last, really, probably a couple decades, I've slowly been distancing myself from politics where I don't pay as much attention as I used to. But the people I respect most, they were humble. And that's a choice. That, that's a habit that we build into our lives. And God's telling us here, hey, put it on. The gentleness, patience. All these things are, are choices we can put on in how we deal with people. And not just the person we dealt with uh, in, the, in this trauma. It's with anybody. It's with everybody. It's, it's with the, you know, the checker at the grocery store who's not going very fast, despite the fact that you're obviously in a hurry. It, you know, maybe it's the person in the next car <laughs> who is driving like a complete idiot. Um, man. Or at like 15 miles per hour. There you go. <laughs> yep. Well, that, that, a lot of people would say that's, that's part of driving like a complete idiot. Uh, but the point is that if we're humble, we can stop and we can realize there have been times I've driven like an idiot, a complete idiot. Anyone here, you know, Drive down the road and you're you're like, you know, 10 miles out of town. And you're like, you know, I don't know what the speed limit is here. <laughs> I'm just going along at whatever speed I feel like. Or maybe you're in downtown Dallas and you turn down the wrong way on a one-way road. Um, I mean, we've all driven like idiots. Let's face it. We've all changed lanes and not realize there was somebody there in the space we were about to try to occupy. What are you looking at me for? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking at you. 
Are you feeling a little convicted? Uh, uh, somebody who drives around for a living? <laughs> Just about? Uh, no, but, I mean, that's all of us. Whether it's, it's dealing with people on a common basis, or like I said, the people who we've got some kind of traumatic history with, <coughs> man, that humility is so important. Because we can realize that person is no better than us, and they're no worse than us. They're a human, a flawed human, created in the image of a perfect God who has twisted that image in a way that's different than the way you've twisted it. But it, we're, we're all still there. We're all still at that point. So that humility, we clothe ourselves in it. Let's move on. Verse 13. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Now, Bear in mind that the book of Colossians is written to a church. So it, it's, it's composed of people who have made Jesus Lord of their life. They, they've taken that forgiveness. They've accepted it. And they've let it revolutionize their lives. That's what a church is. We can have church buildings that are full of either people who are Christians or people who are not. But the odds are pretty good we got a mix um, in every single church building. And, uh, but the book itself is written to people who are Christians. So it's written to the church. And so when he says that, remember, the Lord forgave you, that should provoke in every believer a reminder of what it is you've done, what it is God has forgiven you of. Because I, I can promise you, um, I'm well aware of my flaws. I could come up with, uh, honestly, I could spend the rest of my life writing out the mistakes of my past. Um, if I could actually remember every single one of them. But I've done so many that I can't, I don't have a snowball's chance of remembering all of them. I just couldn't. Uh, and God's forgiven me of all the ones that I remember, all the ones that I've forgotten, and all the ones I'm going to do that I'm going to forget about. He's forgiven me of all of that. There was a song that has been meaningful to me for many, many years now um, by a guy named Stephen Curtis Chapman. And it's called Miracle of Mercy. And I remember it was track number 12 on, uh, on the CD because I would stick that on repeat. And I would just listen to it again. And it basically just goes saying the fact that if everybody knew the person I really am, all the mistakes I've made, you guys would turn away. But God, God didn't. He knows every single one of them. He didn't turn away. He turned toward. He reached out. That's the mercy. That's the grace that God reaches for us with. And so with that in mind, remember verse 13, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you so you must forgive others. We've been forgiven of so much. And it doesn't matter how close you are to a person, how, how often you're around them, we still don't sin against each other as near as much as we sin against God. He's forgiven every single one of those for those of us who are Christians. And I like that first part, how he says, make allowance for each other's faults. Now, this is what church is supposed to be about. This is what the community of the church is supposed to be, making allowance for each other's faults, because I have faults. We can see this in, in a microcosm of the marriage between Tanya and I, because I am not organizational. Tanya is far more organizational than I am. Tanya is not very patient. I, I have more patience than she does. And so we make up for each other's flaws. That's a fact. That's and and a fact. Most, <laughs> most of the times, when the kids have pushed buttons, one of us is able to step back and be the rational person, and the other person loses it, um, in some, to some degree anyway. And so we're able to balance each other out. And that's what the church is supposed to be, is that you guys make up for my faults, my inadequacies, and I have make up for yours, and then you guys each make up for each other's as well. And that's what the church 
is supposed to be. We make allowance for each other's faults. We understand them, we acknowledge them, we work around them, and we fill in where other people lack. And that's what church is absolutely supposed to be. That's, that's why we, we stress community here. Um, and, and I've not done an awesome job of stressing that, of building that into this church. And I need to step that up. Um, but that's why. That's why Jesus built the church. Because we do have these flaws. We do need somebody to make an allowance for our mistakes, for our problems for our, as it says, faults. We need each other. When I can't, you can. When you can't, I can. That's basically what it comes down to. That's what the church is about. We make allowance for each other. It comes back down to, again, in, the, in these relationships, whether it's forgiving that idiot driver in front of you who cut you off, or whether it's forgiving your parents for some deep trauma that they've given you back when you were 4 years old or 12 years old or something. Uh, whenever it is, whatever it is, we can still, because we can draw on the grace of God who's given us so many second chances, and we understand the depths of our sin, our, our mistakes, we're able to use that to stop and say, okay, if God can forgive me for all this stuff, then I can forgive this person for this thing. No matter how big that thing is. And I, I've known people who have had this huge trauma in their life, and, and they were, I've heard people say to me, I just can't forgive. And I recognize that there's points in our lives when, when we're, that's where we are. But I just want to tell you that's not the end of the road. You can work towards the being, getting the point of being able to forgive. I just don't want you to stop there and say, well, I can't forgive them right now. So I'm never going to be able to forgive them. And I just, I don't want that for you because honestly... This idea of forgiving others is mostly a benefit for you. That's an important thing for you to understand. Forgiving them will help them if they know it happens. But whether they know it happens or not, it helps you a hundred times more than it will ever help them. When we forgive, we heal. It comes down to that. Let's plunge on. So, verse 15. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. And so, this idea, I just love it. It starts off, I really want to kind of bring it back into this Sorry, in verse 14. Uh, Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. I was trying to skip a verse there for a minute. And I don't want to do that because, I mean, he talks about, you know, this, this tender-hearted mercy, this humility, this kindness that we're supposed to clothe ourselves in. But he says, above all that, clothe yourselves in love. Make sure that that, I mean, uh, that I, that's kind of like, I guess you could call it the underwear. <laughs> <laughs> of clothing yourselves with good characteristics. It's the stuff we're always supposed to be wearing, at least according to theory anyway. And if it's different, I don't want to know. <laughs> so, at any rate, point is, that this is a vital, absolutely <clears throat> inescapable thing for those of us who are believers. We clothe ourselves in love. It's why we have, as part of our core DNA here at Live Oak, love even when it hurts. Love grows in the soil of a commitment. And you stop and you think about it, every relationship has got to have some level of, quit, of commitment in order for it to be a real relationship. I've got lots of people I, I can call acquaintances. But if I call a person a friend, there's some level of commitment that happens in that. And that's where love flourishes. That's where it's, it becomes easier to love. When there's commitment, 
it grows. When there's not commitment, it dies. And that's a simple fact. And um, we need to understand that principle that we need to choose to put on that love. That's the commitment, really. It comes right down to it. That's why love can't thrive without commitment. Because it's a choice. You are committing to making that choice every day with every person. And I like this idea he puts in here. Um, verse 14, he says, uh, uh, So clothe yourself in love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Well, I'm a musician. So this idea of harmony speaks to me. Um, I can remember times. Um, I remember one time specifically. I was, it was at our last church um, where we came from, Stonewater. And I was leading worship for the youth. Typically, just like I do here, um, typically I was playing by myself. But for whatever reason, this Sunday... I had a full band. Um, it was nice. I had drums. I had uh, a guitar player, uh, and I played the bass, which is my preference. But the best part of it all is that I had two ladies who, either one of these ladies is twice the vocalist I've ever been on my best day. Uh, that's probably their worst day. One of these ladies, I, I believe, really, if she wanted to, she probably could have gone pro. I've heard worse vocalists far and away um, on the radio than this lady. Both of these ladies chose to sing background and did harmony for what I did. So I'm singing the melody, which is, you know, the main part of what everybody knows and sings. But these two ladies were both singing different parts of harmony. So you know what? It sounded a whole lot better. And I remember going up to them afterwards and I said, Thank you for making me sound good. <laughs> because that's what it takes. It takes these people stepping in. I mean, I, I know I'm not a bad vocalist, but I'm never a great vocalist. I'm just, no one's coming and saying, Ross, I, I love your voice. It just moves me. And it hadn't happened. Not going to happen, because that's just not me. I'm not that talented, and I'm fine with that. You know, I, I, don't, I don't need false encouragement or anything like that. Um, like I said, I'm not bad. I, I'm fine. These two ladies made me sound like I was actually good. And that's what it's about. It's this love where we come in, kind of like what we were talking about earlier with, the, with community. We come in, we make allowance for each other's faults, we love each other. And that binds us together in perfect harmony so that we're able to come along and we're able to create this full sound, this full being. Because you know what the church is? The church is the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the head. He's the one making the decisions. He's the one telling us what to do. But we're the ones going out there and executing it. And so it's just, when the church is what it's supposed to be, it, it's like an Olympic athlete. Everything's functioning the way it's supposed to, and we get what we're aiming to do done, and we get it done with almost miraculous results. Really, sometimes with genuinely miraculous results. That's what the church is supposed to be. That's what it comes down to. When we love and it binds us all together in perfect harmony, man, that's what happens. The world steps back and says, honestly, they may not say it out loud, but they're going to say, wow, this organization, this group of people, there's something different. There's something, honestly, kind of amazing about it. And they may disagree with what we're doing. They may disagree with why we're doing it. But they're going to be impressed with what gets done, with the attitude that get, it gets done with. That's what happens when the church operates like it's supposed to, <coughs> all together, bound in perfect harmony. And I love that. And, and it's the same way with these relationships. If we love people the way we're supposed to, if we forgive like we're supposed to, then this relationship that has trauma in its past, we can still, still come together and we can still have that harmony. And I love that. Verse 15. 
and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. So this idea uh, of peace, it, it comes back down again to, it's a kind of a choice. I mean, this peace comes from God, but we don't have to take it in. We don't have to live in peace. I mean, there's, there's God's not going to twist your arm and say, okay, enjoy your Christmas. <laughs> you know, enjoy this gathering together with your family, with where there's at least one person, or maybe even all the people you got some traumatic past with. God's not going to twist our arms. He will not make us have peace in these circumstances. He's offering it. He's there saying, please, please, please take it. But he's not going to make us take it. And that's what it's talking about here. When he's saying, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. What do we usually let rule in our hearts? Honestly, we're, we're all emotional creatures. And our emotions want to rule our hearts. And sometimes that's fine. And then there's the rest of the time. <laughs> it's definitely not. We let anger rule our hearts. We let love um, and unhealthy love rule our hearts. And help us to make bad decisions. And maybe it's, it's, it's excitement. We're so excited at this potential opportunity that we just jump on it and we ignore all the facts of what's staring us in the face. And we jump on and we're like poor for the next five years because of it. Um, I don't know. We're, we're emotional creatures. Our emotions will happily tell us what to do all day, every day, without fail. But that's not what God says. Hey, God's saying, hey, look, I've got this peace. I want you to have it. I want you to let this rule your hearts and so that the anxiety, so that the emotional stuff can't rule it. We are still going to be emotional creatures. We're still going to experience every single one of those emotions. But we don't have to let them rule us. We can step back. We can accept that gift from God, that peace that he gives. And this is another thing that could turn into probably at least one more sermon and probably a whole series about the, the idea of the peace that God gives. But it is a gift. And I don't have time to go deeply into it. But man, this, this, this comes down to the question of when you come into a situation with other people, is what you're doing, is what you're saying, are you trying to bring unity or are you trying to bring division? Because if you step back from it, every way, every interaction... Everything we do with another person, if we're able to divert, divorce ourselves emotionally from that situation, step back and look at it, we're either bringing unity or we're bringing division. Every single interaction, every single relationship. So this peace of God, it's saying, hey, let's bring unity. Let's bring people together instead of separating them. And... You know, I, I recognize that there are people who we call toxic. That's 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 the uh, the term we like to use so much these days. People who are so unhealthy emotionally, spiritually, they're a complete mess. And that, and, and if we get let them get close to us, they're going to create wreck and ruin in our lives. Um, and I recognize that there's got to be some distance with people with that. But, again, going back to um, this lady who wrote for the Huffington Post, you know, I really wish I could get her to sit down with me and just, I could explain these things to her and say, hey, look, you can have these people in your lives. You can have some distance between you because their, their philosophies are so different from yours. Almost to the 180 other side of the extreme. You can still have a relationship with them that is enjoyable and good. You don't have to talk about all these issues, but you don't have to stuff them either. And I, that, that's honestly the way I feel sorry is for her, is that she spent her whole life stuffing that stuff, um, not willing to talk to her parents about what she believed. 
And I don't know her parents. Maybe with her parents that would have been a horrible conversation. I don't know. Uh, but man, there's ways we can work through those things. We can deal with people who are just a complete 180 different from us. And we can still have something of a relationship with them. We can still have a relationship where we're putting on that humility, that tender-hearted mercy, that kindness, all that, despite the trauma of, of dealing with someone who's so very different than us. We can do that. We can let that peace rule our hearts and not let the anger, not let the bitterness, not let the, uh, the passion um, for whatever subject it is um, divide us. We can let it bring us together and say, yes, you believe something I abhor. <laughs> you think things ought to be a way that I think is just plain wrong. And, and I believe the opposite from you. And you feel like what I believe is abhorrent and, and that what I want to do is wrong in this situation. But, you know, we can still come together. We can still play cards at the table or, or whatever it is you like to do with your family. And we can still enjoy those people. We don't have to talk about President Trump or Biden or whatever. We can just have that conversation peacefully and we understand where each other's at and we can move through it. So whether it's the division of political um, philosophies like this lady was dealing with or whether it, it's anything else, man, these steps, we can clothe ourselves with mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. We can... We can make allowance for each other's faults. We can actually forgive even when it's hard because we have been forgiven. And we can finally come at things with this attitude of peace where we're trying to come into every single situation, every single interaction. We're trying to bring unity instead of division. And unfortunately, it does take two people to bring unity um, in an interaction. But you can make sure that your part isn't part that's going to divide. So, when it comes to dealing with the ghosts of Christmas past, God gives us some clear steps, some very simple things. Now, is this easy? Again, no. Almost nothing God asks us to do is easy, okay? If you're thinking otherwise, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but it's it not going to be easy. If you're doing it right, you're not. it's not going to be easy. That's what it comes down to. Because we're all flawed. The people we have to forgive, we don't want to. I mean, uh, forgiveness is not a natural act. None of this is. We have to make active choices to forgive. Active choices to allow for their flaws. We have to make choices to put on peace. To let that rule our hearts. To put on love and mercy and all those other things. We have to make these choices. And it does. It comes down to that. It's choices. And you know what? You can't do that on your own. You can try, but the odds are pretty good you're going to screw it up in some way that might even make things worse. If you try to do this without the help of God, without the Holy Spirit in your life, it's not going to succeed. Part of me really wishes that it were otherwise. The part of me that's independent and self likes to think of myself as self-sustaining. Um, that part of me wishes we could just do this on our own. And it just my life experience, anyway, says it, it ain't working on my own. I've never made it work on my own. Never. Let me say that again. I have never made that work on my own. And honestly, my bet is you can't either. So, what's it going to take? We're going to have to get down on our knees, literally or figuratively, but we're going to have to come to God. We're going to have to ask for help. And you know what the great thing about him is? Is that no matter what we've done, no matter what, what how, how we feel, like our relationship is with him, is that he's there, he's ready to help. He's ready to close the gap between us, whatever that takes. 
so that we can close the gap between whoever it is that we have these ghosts to deal with. And in that way, with the help of God, we can become, I guess you could say, Christmas Ghostbusters. Um, we can take care of that and lay it to rest. That's our God. That's the life he wants us to live, where we're bringing unity into relationships, at least for our part of it, where we're bringing love, tender-hearted mercy, where we're all making those allowances, where we're forgiving. That's the relationships God wants for us. And with his help, relying entirely on his Holy Spirit, man, we can do it. We can totally do it. Or maybe it would be better to say he can do it in us. Let's pray. Lord God, I come to you and I just have to humbly admit my, my complete and utter inability to do what you've asked us to do. That all these relationships, all the ones with whatever level of trauma um, we have, God, I, I can't deal with those well on my own. I need your help. And each of us is in that same boat. We have relationships with trauma in the past. We have situations we've got to forgive. And we can't do that without you. God, you've forgiven us so much. Help us draw on that, to see things from your perspective, and to know that if you can forgive, so can we. We need your help to do it. So, Father, please help us. Let us have an attitude of humility where we're able to come up with things, understanding that we're unable, that we are inadequate. But you can help us, that you will help us. And when we live life your way, it is so much better. It works. It works the way it's supposed to. And um, I, I just... I'm grateful for that and for so much more. Uh, you've given us so much. But help us, God, to lay these ghosts to rest. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, before I cut you guys loose, uh, I just want to go ahead and do, uh, I guess, a couple announcements. Um, like we've been going through in these series, life is traumatic. And, and traumas usually create in us some some poor way of coping with those traumas. And so we have um, these groups for, for ladies. It's Monday nights, 6 o'clock. For men, it's Tuesday nights at 7.30. Both of them at the, the Reunion Center in downtown uh, Comanche. And uh, these are the places to deal with those traumas. So if your coping mechanism is uh, you've got an anger problem, this is a great place to deal with it. If your coping problem is alcohol, uh, then this is a great place to deal with it. But we work together as a group, and we help each other learn to be a little bit more like Jesus and learn to deal with our problems in a healthy way. And we use uh, the 12-step method, which is all biblically based, to do that. And that's what I love about it. Um, so there's that. Uh, there's these things. It's still not too late. You can... Uh, you want one in the month of July, I'll, I'll find one and give it to you, even if i got to make my own label. <laughs> but the point is that these are a fundraiser for the Gateway of Hope in Comanche, which is a maternity home. Um, and so this is a great little fundraiser for them. Just fill it up with some pocket change or put you know, $100 bills in there if you want. I don't care. I don't think they'll care either. I don't, I don't think they'll mind. <laughs> I think they will care. <laughs> Uh, but the point is that if you want one, uh, we would be happy to hook you up. And, and that is just such a big ministry. Um, I, I love what they do there. And so, uh, at any rate, if you want to do that, let us know. We'll get you what you need. Um, that's all I can think of in the way of announcements. Mm -hmm. Pastor Peter. Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, my friend, um, Pastor Peter Wendwa. Um, who is from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, he's going to be here next week. He's going to be the one preaching. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing him. 
of what God's laid on his heart. Um, he's just as humble and a genuine guy as, as I, I've had the honor of knowing. Um, and he uh, he comes to the United States. He, he does a couple things. He, he has a church in Nairobi um, that he's the pastor of. Um, but he comes here to the U.S. not for a vacation or anything. He comes because he runs an orphanage and school for kids. And um, if you're very aware uh, of what life is like in Africa, you know that orphanages are a much bigger thing there than they are here. Um, they've got an AIDS epidemic that we don't have on the level that we don't have anyway. Um, and honestly, something that sounds kind of ridiculous from our way of living, but crocodiles. When you got to go down to a body of water to get your water for the day, every time is a roll of the dice parents have died from being killed by crocodiles um, and that's a very real part of life for many people one one more reason we, why wells need to be built in Kenya and other African nations the point is that there's these these kids that are left over and so he's taken in oh, I think over 150 of them somewhere in that ballpark anyway right now um, he's taken them in they're getting schooling, and it's not just orphans. Uh, kids from the area as well come in, and um, they get an education. And um, so many of them had nothing, and he's providing clothes for, doing what he can to provide clothes and food and everything uh, for them. And so he comes to the United States to meet people, to network, to make people aware of what it is that's being done there. And um, at any rate. Like I said, he's a preacher also, so I'm looking forward to hearing what he's got to say. So, he'll be here next week. And um, I just want to encourage you, if you can, come on out. Or if you can't make it, then, you know, we got this camera. So, <laughs> you can join us virtually. Uh, at any rate, that's all I got for you guys. I love you, and I hope to see you next time.